email this from this morning uh, was not the correct one. So there was some mix up. Okay, but now we are finally ready. Um, okay, so we are very happy to have Sridip telling us about spontaneously broken boost in CFT. All right, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Shuan. Uh, so today I will be going to talk about uh, spontaneously broken boost in CFT. This is a work done with Zohar, Mark, and Avia from Simon Center. And um, so the, the basic idea of the talk is that whenever we have some spontaneous broken symmetry, there are some Goldstone theorems. And these Goldstone theorems are meant to be hold in an infinite volume theory. And it requires some states, single particle or multi-particle states, uh, are required to saturate these Goldstone theorems. So we will try to see what kind of constraint these Goldstone theorems put on the spectrum of a finite volume theory, in particular when the theory under concern is a CFT. So, so the goal is to uh, unpack whatever I just said in the next course of an hour. So let us begin. Uh, let us begin with some, something very basic. What do we mean by these Goldstone theorems? So say we have a D-dimensional quantum field theory with Poincaré invariance, and suppose we also have some continuous internal symmetry group where Q is the generator. So when we say there is a spontaneous symmetry breaking in some state omega, what we mean that there is a state omega and there is some order parameter O, such that if I take the commutator of Q and O in this state omega, then this commutator is not zero. But of course this cannot happen in a finite volume because you can diagonalize Q in a finite volume and then this commutator is forced to be zero. So, so this immediately tells you that the spontaneous symmetry breaking, as we all know, is an infinite volume phenomena. And, and, and from there, it is also clear that because you can diagonalize the Q on the, on the finite volume, there are sectors. And so what happens if you take infinite volume limit, the full Hilbert space becomes uh, closer and closer to some direct sum of some su orthogonal sub-Hilbert spaces. And these sub-Hilbert spaces cannot communicate between each other via action of local operators. And this is how the super selection sectors arise. The other aspect of the fact that this commutator is non-zero in the infinite volume limit is some constraint on the correlator. So for example, if you take this charge density and this order parameter O and calculate the correlator on this state omega, it cannot decay faster than this polynomial thing mod x to the power minus d minus one. And this also tells you that if you take the, take the two-point correlator of this order parameter, it cannot decay faster than x to the power minus d minus two. And this d minus two is very familiar because if you plug in d equals two, you see that it cannot decay faster than order one number. So that means it has to, like the cluster decomposition fails. And this is the familiar reincarnation of coleman marvin wegner theorem that in d equals two, you cannot have spontaneous breaking of some internal symmetry group. But now things slightly change if we, instead of internal symmetry group, if we think about space-time symmetry. So let's move ahead and talk about some space-time symmetry. So here, the setup is same. We have a D-dimensional quantum field theory with Poincaré invariance, and we consider the conserved stress energy tensor, P mu nu. And using the killing vector, we can construct the conserved currents. And again, we can cons consider the generators. So again, the spontaneous, by spontaneous symmetry breaking, we mean this kind of equation, which is meant to hold in the infinite volume theory. And in particular, let us focus on boost symmetry because we'll be dealing with boost symmetry. So the boost generator is integral of this quantity here, which related to stress energy tensor. And most importantly here, you can see there is an explicit dependence on X in the expression for the generator. And this changes the scenario compared to the internal symmetry group case. So for example, naive dimensional analysis will tell you that now the, the, the algebraic consequence of this, quant this equation is that some components of the EM tensor, which is the stress energy tensor, and the order parameter O, I missed that thing here, an order parameter O, they cannot decay faster than x to the power minus d as opposed to this minus d minus one in the internal symmetry group case. And this happens because of the presence of this extra factor. So this means now in D equals two, there is no problem. So this allows for breaking of boost in two dimension. So that's 
that's one aspect where the space-time symmetry breaking up boost is slightly different from the internal symmetry case. But also there is another aspect where it is conceptually different. For example, if you suppose you put, think about the theory and so put- Can you go back please? Yeah. When, what do you have in mind? So you start with a system that has one correct symmetry. Yeah. Spontaneously broken to what? Oh, here I have in mind that there is a Poincaré symmetry and the boost symmetry is broken in the infinite volume. And so, what, is, what is the remaining unbroken symmetry? Uh, the, the, you can think about the rotation group as the unbroken one. And what about translation? Uh, the translation is, okay, the, the spatial, so the, the things we will consider is the spatial translation is not broken, uh, but time translation can be broken, but so, okay, I, let me go ahead a little bit. So the things we will consider, there will be another extra symmetry, U1 symmetry, where there is some large charge sector. So one linear combination of the time translation symmetry and the U1 will be unbroken and basically U1 will be broken, the U1 for the, so there is some sense of time translation symmetry, which is unbroken in the, in the, in the infinite volume limit. So, but if I ignore other symmetries, imagine I don't have another symmetry, just on this slide. So this one Korean, what is it broken to? I guess so here it's slightly tricky because of the following reason, uh, like the thing I was going to tell you. So if you the put the theory on a, on a finite volume, then for example, on a cylinder where you have the like R times HD minus one, then the symmetry between space and time is already broken. So there is no notion of boost symmetry on the compact space. So only if you look at a very small patch on the sphere, there is some sense of approximate boost symmetry. And you can break that approximate boost symmetry only in the sense of this equation. Like you take some finite energy density state and, and then you can find an order parameter so that this equation is non-zero. So there is no super selection sector, for example, because there is no notion of boost symmetry on the compact space on a finite volume. So for example, when you say that boost is spontaneously broken, is yeah. it all boosts are broken or only boosts in a particular direction? Which is which symmetry is broken and which is not? The, uh, in all direction, the boost symmetry is broken. So, so basically what I mean is that if you take the, let me write it down here. So, so the order parameter is basically T zero J. And what I mean, if you take this commutator and if you take a finite energy density state, like if you take omega to be finite energy density state, then this is non-zero. And what about the commutator of two boosts? Is it broken or not? Uh, the commutator of two boosts, I guess that would also be broken. Uh, let's see. Commutator of two boosts is a rotation, right? Right, that's why I'm asking the question because he said that the rotation is not broken, but uh, the boost is broken. So I'm just trying to understand the unbroken group. Maybe I should not, I, I shouldn't slow you down. You can continue. Yeah, I guess the, the state we are considering there, rotation is not broken. So probably KI, KJ, yeah, I'm not sure. Well, Sridip, is there going to be an example you'll give? Yeah, yeah, in the, I will be giving an example of superfluid, right? There, the rotation is not broken. Uh, should I go ahead? Uh, are you saying anything, Edward? No. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, so as I was saying, the boost symmetry is conceptually different because there is no boost symmetry in compact space. You can only focus on a very small patch and on that small patch, there is an approximate boost symmetry and you can spontaneously broke, break it only in the sense of this, this equation where this is the boost generator and this is some order parameter like T zero G. And, and, and the whole point is because this is non-zero, this implies some constraint on the correlators. 
And you can ask what kind of states satisfy those constraints and that will put some constraint on the finite volume theory as well. So, so we, we can ask ourselves intuitively what happens before going into the full CFT business. Uh, so, so suppose we consider a theory in a box of size L and this, we take a pick up a state with a finite energy density epsilon. And as we will show later that if you take a finite energy density state, state with energy density epsilon, then the boost is broken in the sense of this equation that you take ki t zero j, take the commutator in the state omega, then this is basically epsilon plus p delta ij, with probably with a factor of i here. So this means that there will be some algebraic decay in the infinite volume theory and in the infinite volume theory, epsilon to the power minus one over D is the length scale. So the algebraic, so, so this means we have an UV scale and we have an IR scale. And if these two scales are well separated, then, and if we probe the theory on a length scale, which is much bigger than this, much smaller than this, then we should expect an algebraic decay. And because there is an algebraic decay, then this immediately tells you there should be some sense of gap which should be smaller than this inverse length scale, which is epsilon to the power one over t. So this immediately tells you naively, it immediately tells you there would be an energy gap above this finite energy density state, which is goes like epsilon to the power one minus gamma over t times L to the power minus gamma, where I put in the factor of L to make up for the dimension. So the most natural value of this exponent is one. If you assume in deep infrared, there is some fixed point of RG flow, and there is some scale invariant theory which describes this infinite volume physics. But you will see in this in the CFT how it comes about. So in the CFT, like instead of putting the theory in a box, it's more natural to put the CFT on a cylinder, which is SD minus one times R. And as we all know, the energy is related to delta over R, where delta is a scaling dimension. So we, if we apply the same consideration as we applied before, we see there is an energy gap which should scales like epsilon to the power one minus gamma over T times R to the power minus gamma. And we can relate this epsilon with, this, with my finite energy density state, which has a scaling dimension of delta omega. So epsilon is related to delta omega over R to the power T. And then I can translate this in terms of a basic CFT like statement. So where where in the delta omega going to infinity limit, I know there is a gap which scales Sorry, like- Sorry, yeah. you can I ask a question? What, what is this gap? If you put a CFT on the cylinder, you know precisely its spectrum in terms of scaling dimension. So what is this uh, energy gap here in this so, case? So here, yeah, yeah, you are, so, so basically what we are assuming here that, so what, whatever I am saying right now is trivial in the sense that from a CFT perspective, like if you take a state, primary state with a scaling dimension delta omega, there are descendants which would of course saturate this bound or which is, but the point is there has to be the ultimately the statement I am going to make is that if you take a state delta omega and if you assume that uh, that state delta omega is some sort of a ground state of some modified Hamiltonian, then there is a notion of gap and that gap should scale with the delta omega in this manner. Is that clear? Honestly, no, <laughs> sorry. I, I'm confused what E gap means because uh, so, okay. what is this gap of? Is this the gap of the Hamiltonian of the CFT on the cylinder? Uh, because no. of that, you know the spectrum. No, no, no. So I guess I should have clarified this. So, so at the end of the day, we will be looking at some correlators like this from a, from a very CFT. I'm jumping ahead, but let me tell you this. So we will be looking at correlator like this. And then one of the assumption is that uh, whatever appears in the S channel here, the scaling dimension of all the operators appearing in S channel is like has a scaling dimension which is greater than delta omega. And this assumption is very natural for a superfluid like object where you can, where you have a superfluid like EFT description for this thing. And then Omega has a physical interpretation that it is the ground state of a 
large, like if, if you restrict on a sector which has a very large charge, and then if you consider the ground state restricted on this large charge sector, then omega would be the ground state of that thing. So there is some Hamiltonian hidden uh, whose ground state is this omega. That Hamiltonian might be uh, some, you consider some CFT with a new one and consider a large charge and you fix your focus on some large particular large charge sector and ask yourself what is the ground state with that U1, with that U1 charge. Well, omega here, as you say, is not the ground state of the CFT. It's some large charge state. Yeah, yeah. So delta omega is not the ground state of the actual CFT, but it is the ground state of something. It, and that something, that extra handle could be anything else. A concrete example is the superfluid one where you have extra U1 and you are looking at some large charge sector. Okay, maybe, uh, maybe it will become clearer when you go into more detail, thanks. Yeah, let me like let me go ahead and you can ask me again if it's not clear later. Okay, so so here you have the existence of a gap, but as I was saying, this was trivial for descendants because because the descendants like clearly if you have to take a state with delta omega, then there are descendants which are like at order one gap. So so this is trivial for descendants. But the whole point is, as we show later, that the twist comes from the fact that descendants don't really matter this, for this Tambu Goldstone theorems. And, and so the only players in the game are the primary ones. And so this bound, as we'll show later, that is applicable for the primary. So, so we'll show that if, we, if, you, if you pick up a state like delta omega, then there will be and this delta omega is the ground state of some modified Hamiltonian, then there has to be a gap of this sort. And we will make this physical insight precise and argue for gamma equals one. So, so to put things on the bigger context, we are basically trying to, cons like, trying to put constraint on the CFT spectra in various limits. So there are basically various approach to this problem. Like for example, we have numerics where, so as I was saying that, the, as we all know, the CFT spectra is determined by this delta and J. And, and there is some extra handle where you assume the CFT has some extra symmetry, which is maybe U1, for example, and then you have these various star sectors. And then you can do numerics for near the origin, which is the usual CFT bootstrap. Then you can do the light cone bootstrap for states with delta around J. And there are tau variant theories where you look at states which have like order one spin, order one charge, where delta is asymptotically large, which is like the where you obtain Cardi-like densities. And then there are states where, which are very special states where you are basically looking at some large charge sector and looking at some ground state of that large charge sector. So there the delta scales with some power law where basically delta scales like q to the power d over d minus one. And then you can look at some excitation above these ground states. So, so whatever statement I am making, I will be making is basically is applicable to this region where you have in some sense some ground state and there are excitation above the ground states and you are trying to say uh, like how much, how bigger that gap can be from a CFT perspective. And, but, but, but the point is like, because in most of our analysis, we just need to assume that it is some sort of ground state. We do not need to explicitly, like we can be agnostic about what this extra handle is. It can be U1, it can be something else. Okay, is that better, Peter? Well, I mean, I still don't understand what Hamiltonian you're looking at, but uh, please go on and uh, I'll ask if I have a question. Okay. Can I ask a question, uh, Shredi? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, in the example with the uh, large charge sector, mm -hmm. uh, so by the gap, do you mean uh, that if you fix a large charge and you consider operators of this yeah. charge, 
then there is a vacuum which scales like you wrote as q yeah. d over d minus one yeah and then there, there are excited states which are like phonons yeah yeah so exactly. by the gap do you mean just the uh energy of these goldstone bosons uh of these phonons above this uh uh above this uh yeah vacuum in the fixed charge state yeah right okay yes that's a more concrete thing, right? So, so I think that that should answer Peter's question. The yeah. gap is just, at least in this example, yeah, with U one symmetry, gap is a gap in the fixed charge sector above the vacuum in that sector. Sorry, let, let me ask again. So, are the Goldstone bosons below the gap or above the gap? Below the gap. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, let me go ahead. Uh, so, so to put the constraint on the CFT, we start with. Uh, so, so first of all, we. I have I have another question. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, the spectrum of the theory in the end of the day is not relativistic because it's not, you don't have boost. So what do you really mean by mass and so forth? Is it the energy to create this state or is it the coefficient in the dispersion relation? These are not the same thing. Wait, what? Can you say that again? What is, what? Really? So yeah. we have a system which where boost was spontaneously broken. So as a warm up, let's consider a system where there's no boost symmetry at all. Mm -hmm. uh, in that case, the notion of mass is not clear. You can define mass either as the energy to create one particle yeah. or as the, the, the coefficient that appears in the dispersion relation between kinetic energy and velocity or momentum. I see. So which of the two are you talking about? I guess here I am talking about I think here I am talking about the first one because there are phonon modes and then this phonon modes in the, in the superfluid example there are phonon modes and these phonon modes correspond to a reggae trajectory on the CFT. So basically you have this state delta omega and the phonon modes are like uh, let me write it down. So the phonon modes are like delta omega plus some delta, where delta has some dispersion relation, which is L into L plus D minus two. So these are the excitations, basically delta omega plus delta in terms of the CFT quantity. And then you can transfer it to the energy by dividing by the radius of the sphere and so on. So these are, so in the infinite volume limit, these are of course gapless excitations, but yeah. Does that answer your question, Nati? Yes, thank you. Okay, good. Okay, so so now let us try to understand like how we can, so we want to understand this implication of this Goldstone theorems on our setup. So we want to write it down in a more useful form. So, so when we say there is a spontaneous breaking of boost, we basically mean there is a generator Ki, oops, sorry. There is a generator Ki and there is a order parameter T0j. And just by the usual commutation relation, you, and the fact that you take the state omega to be a finite energy density state, you can write it as epsilon plus P times delta IJ. And because you take a finite energy density state, this is non-zero and this is the precisely the sense in which there is a breaking of boost. And also on the other hand, you can write down this Ki, this generator as an integral over T00. So basically this left-hand side can be expressed as an integral of the commutator of these two quantities, T00 and T0j. 
And so basically this quantity has to be same as this quantity. And if you relate these two things and go to the Fourier space, then it tells you that the, in the Fourier space, this commutator in the K going to zero limit should behave in this particular way. So often it is useful to strip off this factor of twice pi. And so we do that and we write down in terms of spectral density. So this tells you that the derivative of the spectral density in K going to zero limit goes like epsilon plus P delta IJ and there's a delta of omega. So if you have some extra handle, like for example, if you have some U1, then this finite energy de density state can also turn out to be a finite charge density state. And then you can think about the spectral density of T0, zero, zero and JJ. And again, you can show that in the K going to zero limit, the if you take derivative and take K going to zero limit, it has to behave like this. And also you can write down other sum rules which can be thought of appearing from number goldstone theorem for broken dilatation, or they can also be derived from these two basic ones by using conservation for T and conservation for J. And the fact you are on, you, you are on the CFT, you are, you are dealing with the CFT. So this blue one is related to this blue one and this red one is related to this red one. And you can see that if you, for example, you can see if you can track this i and j, there is a factor of d minus one and this d minus one times epsilon plus p because becomes d epsilon because you are on a CFT. So, so, so broadly speaking, this is, this is the setup we have that we have an omega, which is a finite energy density state. And you are looking at some commutator where A is like the generator and B is like the order parameter. And this commutator in the K going to zero limit on the Fourier space has to give something universal, which we know precisely in terms of the energy density or the charge density of the state omega. And now the question is like, if we insert a complete set of states here, then we can ask what kind of states saturated the sum rule and reproduces this universal thing on the right-hand side in the infinite volume theory. So we look for those states in the infinite volume theory and existence of such states in the infinite volume theory are already put constraints on the finite volume theory. So, so basically we will explore this set, explore this situation when we have CFT, and then we have to look at the correlators on the, on the cylinder and look at the, look at the states what appears in the S channel. So this would be our rough goal or rough idea how to proceed. So in particular, we will be using a sum rule which involves T00 and T00. So, so earlier I told you that the T0j is the order parameter. So there is a spectral density, which is rho T00, T0j. And if you take derivative with respect to K and take K going to zero limit, then this has some particular behavior. Then you can use the conservation equation to relate T0j with T00 and write down a spectral density, the behavior of the spectral density for this T00, T001. Where again, you can see it, it's, it is proportional to epsilon plus P and it goes like K square and there is a delta prime of omega. And as we all know, this spectral density is related to this T00, T00 correlator. So basically we will be starting the correlator omega T00, T00 omega. And you can see here, I have written tau and N1 to denote the fact that we will be starting this correlator on the cylinder. Okay, so, so to be concrete, consider the CFT on R times SD minus one. We pick up a state with a finite energy density and then basically take the macroscopic limit in a way so that the energy density is kept finite and fixed. And the idea is that the macroscopic limit should satisfy this sum rule here or the Goldstone theorem. And then the aim is to identify the states that are responsible for saturating this sum rule and this would immediately tell us what kind of state should we have on the, on the finite volume theory. So again, I repeat, we want to understand the following correlator in the S channel in the macroscopic limit. And one of the assumptions that we will put in that whatever states appear in between in the S channel, the delta is, so 
this, so say the states appearing in the in this S channel has uh, scaling dimension delta omega plus delta, and we will assume that delta is greater than zero. And this assumption somehow encodes the fact that that this omega is some spatial state. It is some ground state of some modi for some modified Hamiltonian. And again, for so, sorry, this is where I'm getting confused. You keep saying that this is a ground state of modified Hamiltonian, but in practice, what you're looking at is it's some fixed charge sector. So yeah. why do you need this modified Hamiltonian then if you're just looking at fixed charge sector? Oh, by modified Hamiltonian, I just means you consider H minus mu times Q. Oh, but this is different from considering a fixed charge state. Why? I mean, adding, well, adding, adding chemical potential for the charge is different from say, saying that charge is equal to some concrete number, right? Wait, normally when you when you go to a fixed charge ensemble, you add a chemical potential and then just minimize your Hamiltonian, right? Oh, but it, it, it's still an ensemble, right? Uh, so, okay. Sorry, I'm probably being so, but is omega, I thought that you were looking at fixed charge, like you know, charge equals 10 billion or something. Right, so, so omega is the ground state of a fixed charge on, yeah, fixed charge sector, right. This is different from saying that you consider some ensemble and you add the chemical potential for this charge because the ensemble averages will uh, receive contributions from various charges, not just from Q equals exactly 10 billion, but you know, something else as well. Wait. Can I just think about your, like just for me, for simplicity, so I don't go crazy. Can I just think that you're, all you're doing is just working in a particular charge sector. Since charge is, charge is conserved, so I don't have to worry about the fact that you're fixing it. Yeah, you can think about that, think in that way as, as well. Like, basically, you are looking at a fixed charge sector and then doing your computation in the fixed or large charge. OK, thanks. OK. So let's move ahead. So as I was saying that the, the, the main aim is to look at this correlator and then the points I'm going to tell you that, that there are states appearing in this S channel, but in the macroscopic limit or the infinite volume limit, the descendants drop out. So whatever contributes in the macroscopic limit are the primaries. So we have direct access to the primaries. So we need to show that the descendants drop out and then we'll see that how that can put constraints on the spectrum of primaries. So ideally we should be looking at, and effectively the fact that descendants drop out is related to the fact that some properties of the conformal block. Ideally we should be looking at the spinning conformal blocks, but it turns out that uh, at least for T00, T00 in the macroscopic limit, these complications do not arise and we can safely look at the scale, scaling blocks and argue for the fact that the descendants drop out in the infinite volume limit. So, so roughly speaking, as we all know, the blocks looks like this, where we have a bunch of coefficients and some, some, some function of ZZ bar, and there is some Gegenbauer polynomials, which depends on these quantities L, M, and N, where M, N characterizes this descendant level, and L is the spin of the intermediate spin, and these blocks also depend on the on the dimension, scaling dimension of the intermediate primary that appears in this channel. And so when we say descendant dropouts, which what we mean that in this sum only n equals n equals zero gives the dominant contribution. So to be more concrete, we can we can we can see this, for example, in the scaling blocks, uh, scalar blocks. So uh, so, for example, you can you can consider this G delta L, which has an expansion of this form, where you have this coefficient R M N, and then there is a power of Z Z bar, and then there is this Gegenbauer polynomial. So, for example, you can think of a 4D CFT where these scaling blocks are known explicitly as a function of hypergeometric function, and um, and then you can take the macroscopic limit of this quantity explicitly. And by macroscopic limit, I mean this following limit where 
you basically take z equals one plus u over r and the macroscopic limit reads like this r becomes very large where u is kept fixed. So, and this u becomes the coordinate on the in, of the infinite volume theory. So, so you can, so, so what you can do, for, at least for the 4D CFT, you, what you can do, you can take this block, take these blocks, which you know explicitly and take this particular limit, you get an expression. And then you ask what kind of summons actually reproduces this sum on the left-hand side. And it turns out that only m equals n equals zero pieces contribute to this sum, to, the, to this particular macroscopic limit of this quantity G delta L. And you can show this for various values of delta and L. Delta and L can be order one numbers. It can be order R as R becomes large. So in all scenarios, you can see, you can show that only m equals n equals zero contributes. And if you want to show this in all generality, then you have to use the recursion relations for these R M N quantities, which can be used using Dolan Osborne results. And the same results also hold for the spinning conformal blocks. So at the end of the day, you show that the descendants drop out and whatever remains are the primaries. So, so now we only have primaries in the game and you want to see what constraint comes from this quantity here. So the first thing to notice that this is, relate, this is in the omega and k variable. So it has to be related to the Fourier transform of T0, T0 correlator to be precise, the commutator. So the first step is to write down the correlator on the cylinder, which we write down like this, where there is a contribution from the state omega with epsilon is the energy density. And there are contribution from descendants from of this delta omega, which are suppressed. And there, then there are new primaries, which contributes like this to this correlator. So now you can see here, there are two things. First of all, this is a sum over delta and L. And then there are Gegenbauer polynomials here. So there are two steps to do. We have to identify this delta and L with the macroscopic variable omega and K. And somehow we have to relate this Gegenbauer polynomials with plane waves, because at the end of the day, we want a Fourier transform. And these two things can be done quite naturally by doing this. So you define some density of states, which is related to the density of state, which is related to the delta and L by this, by this relation. So basically you do a change of variable from delta and L to omega and K. And the Gegenbauer polynomials has a nice, in the macroscopic limit, indeed becomes like plane waves. So, so it's, it's almost like this, that you are looking at some small patch of the sphere. And on that small patch, all the angular momentum modes becomes almost becomes like some angular average of the plane waves. And this is precisely this relation where you can see that in the macroscopic limit, the Gegenbauer polynomial becomes an angular average of this e power i k x. So you use these two expressions and plug that in in the expression for this four point correlator and take the macroscopic limit. And once when all the dust settles, settles, you see that this correlator in the macroscopic limit looks like epsilon square plus some integral over omega and k. And here you can see this e power i k x appears very naturally. And this e power delta tau over r becomes e power minus omega tau. And in the Lorentzian signature, this indeed becomes like a Fourier transform. And all this OP coefficient information about OP coefficient, they goes in this quantity k omega k, which is basically the density of states in the infinite volume limit times this OP coefficients divided by some factor of R. So you have this expression and here you can see only the primaries contribute because only these OP coefficients appear and the descendants drop out. Now from this expression, you can easily read up the spectral density, which is related to this quantity K. So you have this K omega K minus K minus omega K over K. And you have to compare this with your number Goldstone sum rule. Now, now the crucial point is that this sum rule, this tells you that there has to be a support at omega equals zero. And this immediately tells you that there has to be a state in the omega going to zero and P going to zero limit or 
I'm using k here, sorry. In the k going to zero limit. And if we translate it in terms of the delta and L variable, this tells you that delta gap over R has to go to zero and L over R has to go to zero. And, and recall that delta omega is a, because omega is a finite energy density state, I can exchange capital R uh, and trade it off against delta omega. So this immediately tells you that there are two relations which tells you that delta gap over delta omega to the power one over D goes to zero and L over delta omega to the power one over D, this also goes to zero. So this tells you that the gap is uh, little o of capital R. This is not quite order one because little o of capital R means that for every positive number, there exists a state which is, which scaling dimension is below C times capital R. And so from here to argue for big O or like big O of one gap, one needs to assume further existence of some scale invariant theory, which describes the infinite volume physics. So here in this last step, this last step is really like some, as you mean something physical. So for example, you can think of a superfluid EFT, the one I was mentioning before and Bauer also mentioned, there you have this phonon modes and the phonon modes will, will be the one which saturated the sum rule and which will satisfy these equations. And so, and not only that, not only we can put bounds on the on the on the primaries that appear in this S channel, we can so also have a, yeah. May I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, sure. So the the Goldstone argument does, shows that there is a mode with zero uh, frequency, right? Um, how do you know what the dispersion relation is? I mean, could it be that the omega is equal to k squared or omega? equal to k. I think you are saying that omega will go like k, but uh, I just want to understand where this comes from. Are you mean for this last bit of argument? Well, you, you, I think uh, if I understand correctly, you are trying to find the, these massless modes, right? The light modes, the custom modes. Yeah, I guess so. The, I guess here I should um, point also one thing. So the point is there are these Goldstone theorems, but it is not necessarily mean that there would be a Goldstone single particle states which which has to saturate this theorem. So okay. So for example, you can think of the Fermi surface. Think about the free fermions with a finite charge density. So you have the right, particles. right. And there also you can think about these Goldstone theorems. They are boosts in okay. and they are okay, using yeah. particle hole pairs. Mm -hmm. So they are multi-particle states, like double particle states, which saturates the sum rule. Right. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So where was I? Yeah. So, so the point is you can not only say about the spectrum of primaries, you can also bound the OP coefficient and this completely comes from the fact that we are assuming there is a macroscopic limit that exists because the macroscopic, so just recall there is a K omega K here and this K omega K is related to the density times the OP coefficients divided by this thing. And the very fact that in the capital R going to infinity limit is a well-defined limit. It tells you that the OP coefficients cannot grow faster than this, uh, faster than this r to the power d plus three. And if you do a more careful analysis, you can show that uh, this OP coefficient has to be of the order delta omega times r cube, where basically delta omega accounts for this r to the power d. So, 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 basically, so basically it tells you that there has to be a state which, which is like, which goes like or little o of r or little o of delta omega to the power one over d and the OP coefficients of that state with the omega and T zero zero has to be of this big O of delta omega times R cube. So once we have this thing, uh, I guess not to ask a question. Is it clear that there is a particle interpretation in this setup? I guess, so 
when we are doing the CFT analysis, we do not need to assume that there is a particle interpretation or anything. We, we are just saying that we are looking at these correlators and we are saying what, what, what can appear in between. But there was a whole discussion about the particle and the mass of the particle and this and that. Uh, well, all these issues need to be rethought when in this setup. Yeah, but I guess we are not, so I am not really explicitly referring to mass of the particle or anything like that, right? I am just. Uh, Okay. Yeah, because I guess the point is because for, for example, when you have this particle hole pairs along uh, like on the top of Fermi, Fermi surface, there you cannot think of it as some goldstone boson because it's not really a single particle excitations. Okay, so so now we have basically three, three equations or three relations, three bounds. This tells you that there has to be spin, which scales like this. There has to be like operators with scaling dimension, which goes like this. And then there are OP coefficients, which is big O of delta omega times R cube. So we can verify these equations in various setups. For example, the setups we tried is the superfluid one and the free scalar field in D greater than true, free fermions and 2D CFT. So I will mostly focus on superfluid and 2D CFT. So, so just roughly speaking, you look at this correlator and basically, as I was saying, you, you basically look what states appears in the S channel that is responsible for saturating the sum rule. For the superfluid case, you can see there is a Rege trajectory, uh, um, which is, I wrote before, delta as a function of L. And this Rege trajectory become the single particle states, which is basically the phonons in the infinite volume theory. And they are responsible for saturating the sum rule. For the free scalar field is slightly more complicated. There are particle hole states above the, above some, like if you take some large charge state, uh, but they are effectively single particle because they are labeled by single quantum number. If you think about the free fermions and the Fermi surface, then there are particle hole pairs around the Fermi surface. So there are truly the two particle states and these two particle states saturate the sum rule in the infinite volume limit. And in the 2D CFT in some way mimics the superfluid case because there also you can see a Rege trajectory of new SL2R primaries. They, are, they behave like single particle states in the, in the macroscopic limit and they saturate the sample. But in but in but because you have a bigger algebra, which is Virasoro, so these new SL2R primaries are actually Virasoro descendants of identity. Virasoro descendants of the, by identity, I mean Virasoro descendants of this state delta omega. And furthermore, one can also verify the sum rules in hydrodynamics. So let us move ahead to the example of superfluid. So in the superfluid example, you consider a CFT on a cylinder. So this is much more concrete. So here you have a CFT on a cylinder with an extra symmetry U1. So you consider a state with a large charge, which is Q and, and the scaling dimension of, and this large charge Q breaks your U1 and the boost symmetry. So, so what happens there is a separation of energy scale in if the Q is very large, the UV scale is basically denoted by the charge density, which is rho to the power minus one over d minus one. And there is IR scale, which is this R. If, if you take your charge Q to be very large, then this scale and this scale, they are very well separated. And there is a EFT description written by Hellerman and these other people. There is a EFT description of the physics in between this scale and where one over Q is the cutoff of your EFT. And the symmetry breaking pattern is basically you start with a CFT, SOD plus one comma one, and there's a U1, and it breaks down to SOD and one linear combination of U1 and time translation is preserved, which I wrote down as U tilde one. So because there is a semi concrete symmetry breaking pattern, you can write down an EFT by CCGWA. And so basically there is a phase field chi, which takes the wave mu, 
And there is a fluctuation of this field chi, which I denoted as pi. So this pi is the Goldstone boson for this broken U1. And then you can write down an action for this pi, which in leading order looks like this. So this describes your all the phonon modes and all the basic dynamics of the superfluid in the infinite volume theory. And then also one can write down the excitation above this ground state. So I have taken this picture from Gabriel's paper. Uh, so here, basically, this is the ground. This this line denotes the ground state, the state which breaks the has the large charge and which breaks the boost and the U1 symmetry. And then there are phonon excitation, which has this dispersion relation, which goes like delta L s square root L times L plus d minus two. And so, so basically, in this setup, you you look at this correlator, which goes like omega t. Look at this correlator, and because there is an EFT description, you can you can figure you can basically explicitly write, evaluate this correlator and break it down into contribution coming from different primaries. And you can, and it turns out that this this excitation of phonon this phonon modes basically appears as some reggae trajectory, and and this reggae trajectory is what saturates the sum rule. So when these operators are over and over the scalar primaries, then Bauer, Shasha, and Jeffries has a paper where they nicely spot, nicely, nicely wrote it down how different primaries contribute to the to this correlator. So here we do a similar procedure instead of scalar primary O, we have some operator T00 and T00. But effectively the identification are kind of same. So once you do that, you can you can basically immediately can read off the OP coefficients from that from the point of view of EFT. And this OP coefficients has a nice expression in terms of the L and 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 the dimension you are in. And once you have the OP coefficients, you can do your next best thing. You can you can easily read off the the spectral density in the infinite volume limit because Earlier, I told you there was a function k which encodes the information about the OP coefficients, and the spectral density is related to this function capital K. So, so you write down the spectral density, which has a nice form, and then you can take the soft limit, which is p going to zero limit, and you can immediately see if you take this limit, it saturates the sum rule. So this immediately tells you that this single part, these phonon modes are the ones which are responsible for saturating the sum rule in the superfluid case. And they are of course single particle states because in the infinite volume theory, they are just excitations of these phonons. Okay, so this ends the superfluid section. And okay, and um, I should mention about one more thing. So whatever I just told you about superfluid, this setup is a parity non-violating setup. But one can also consider a parity violating setup, which has been considered very recently in last month by Gabriel, Luca, and Uma. So there they have seen some extra modes which are not really phonon modes. And these extra modes are softer and goes like u to the power three half, minus three half. But then then they have also seen there are so there are like coexistence of these phonon modes and these modes which are like some vortex modes. So it turns out that this phonon mode, we have already so shown that the phonon modes are the ones which are responsible for saturating the sum rule. So from our perspective, this immediately tells us that these vortex modes cannot play any role in the, in the, in the for the infinite volume physics. And this is evidently corroborated by this paper where they are, have actually pointed out this, this OP calculated this OP coefficients of these vortex modes with T00 and the state delta omega, and they are indeed suppressed and they cannot play any role for the sum rule. And also the fact that the vortex solutions cannot survive in the infinite volume limit supports the fact that the phonon modes were the actual ones, even in the parity violating setup, the phonon modes are the important ones that saturate the sum rule. Okay, for and then comes the 2D CFT. In the 2D CFT, what happens that, of course, U1 cannot be continuously spontaneously broken because you are in 2D, 
But nonetheless, you can consider a state omega, which has a finite energy density. And again, you can think about this correlator, which is omega t t omega. And because you are in 2D and this is basically controlled by the Virasoro identity module, you can explicitly compute this correlator and you can find out an expression and take the macroscopic limit of this quantity and verify that. In fact, in 2D, you can actually verify that the macroscopic limit exists. And once you have the macroscopic limit, you can calculate the spectral density. And again, you can show that in the K going to zero limit, the, 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 the sum rule is saturated. And if you probe a little bit more, you can see that the sum rule is again saturated by similar kind of regate trajectory. These are regate trajectory of new SL2R primaries, but in terms of the Virasoro, they are Virasoro descendants. But the story is slightly similar to the 2D CFT. So is there any question at this point? Okay, if not, I will switch gear. And um, for the last bit, I will just, because by this time I have mentioned a couple of times that the, that the, the story, the 2D CFT story sounds somewhat similar to the superfluid in the higher dimension. So it's a natural question to ask like whether there is some EFT which reproduces this answer just like in the superfluid case. So this is the, this is the full answer for the 2D CFT when in, if you take the TT correlator in the state omega, and then you can ask that whether there is an EFT which does that. So a natural candidate would be the superfluid EFT that I just wrote down and specialize it to D equals two. So the leading term would be a free scalar thing, which is del phi del, del bar phi, where phi is the analog of the field chi. And then you can, but then this doesn't reproduce this TT correlator completely. So, so you have to add some corrections. And then this correction is related to this extra term, which is, which is proportional to C minus one over 12, 12 pi. And this looks very singular, but the whole point is you are supposed to expand phi around a non-trivial vacuum. So you are not expanding phi around zero. So this is well-defined. So this story somewhat resembles the EFT of long string by Paul Chinsky and Strominger, uh, but here we have only a single scalar field phi. And one of the prediction of this EFT is that one can again calculate the, the the delta Q, which is the dimension of this charge Q sector, the lowest dimension ground state, which is goes like Q squared over twice kappa plus C minus one over 12. Now at this point, the, natural, the next natural question is to ask whether one can push this EFT to further down and write down more terms. And it turns out that the crucial observation is at that point that all the EFT terms that could possibly we can write down, they all vanish on shell. So one can write down a field redefinition which makes the EFT Lagrangian look like a free field. So I have written this phi tilde, this phi tilde is related to this phi by some complicated uh, redefinition. And of course the stress energy tensor is not the usual free field one, Rather, it gets corrections under field redefinition. So, so now the idea is to write down the most general form of T and impose the TTOP so that, so that the TTOP has arbitrary central charge. So it turns out one can do it up till very high order for if you only consider on TTOP. But then this, this thing faces a crucial problem, which I will tell you in the next slide that in 2D, if you have a discrete spectrum, then you can easily show that there is a U1 left and U1 right, and the U1 get promoted to the cock mode U1. So if you take your state delta omega to be not only Virasoro primary, but also the cock mode primary, so then you have to also impose the JJOP and TJOP. And if you also, so if you want to impose the JJOP, TJOP, and the TTOP, it immediately forces you to have C equals one. And so either you give up on the cock moody symmetry, in that case, the such CFTs must have continuous spectra and it would be very weird, or we are forced to make C equals one, in which case the EFT, would be, EFT story would be non-trivial. So the lesson of this doing this exercise is either one has to construct the EFT with more than one fields, it would be more complicated, or 
you have you are dealing with some spatial scenario and uh, a more practical application could be some large chart sector of some boundary 3d cft where one needs to take into account some boundary trace anomaly and in those scenarios this uh, this kind of eft or this this kind kind of lagrangian i wrote down might be useful but yeah but we haven't really thought much about this last point but we hope it could be useful for some purpose. So this is all I had. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, can I have a quick question? So in your previous slide, yeah. um, are phi and phi tilde, are they compact scalar field? Yeah. So phi tilde is related to phi by some field redefinition? Yes. And that field redefinition doesn't ruin the compactness of the scalar field. Uh, no, in principle, no. So, so the point is here. So we have not really written down an explicit, uh, uh, explicit uh, re redefinition from phi to phi tilde. So we assume that there is a redefinition which takes you from phi and phi tilde, and then it boils down to. Uh, of the question that can you write down a general form of t which is permitted by the symmetry and you only need to fix the coefficient of the uh, so basically you are trying to write down the stress energy tensor in terms of this field phi tilde and and then can you figure out the coefficients by imposing the ttop i probably have a slide later let me see uh, for example it looks something like this So you write down, so you just try to write down a most general form of tree, which is consistent with TTOP and the fact there is a phi tilde. And can you say a little bit more, why is the central charge fixed to be one? I didn't get that part. Oh, so, so the, the way we have seen this, that you write down a most general form of T, write down a most general form of J, oh. and you try to impose these two conditions, these three conditions that TTOP has to be of the prescribed form with the central charge C, the JJOP has to be of the sum form, and the TJOP has to be of the sum form. If you impose these three conditions, then the only consistent way it can happen that C equals one. But usually the Sugawara condition tells us C can be greater or equals to one, right? So can, can you say again, what's the additional condition that comes? Oh, I guess here, I guess the crucial point is that um, you are dealing with a single phi fit. Oh. So, so because if you are dealing with a single phi fit, there is no way to like go ahead of C equals one. So that's why I said that probably the lesson of the story is that you need more fields to describe the large charge sector of 2D CFT. But uh, this- uh, If you have something like a linear dilatometer that also has only one scalar, but can change the central charge. Yeah. So you, are you thinking of adding a linear gelatin term to this action? For, for example. Hmm. Maybe the U1 will not be U1, but R, I, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, I'm not sure what will happen, but. Okay. Yeah, but I think as long as you have a single field, you probably can, cannot go out of the C equals one thing. So I didn't mention there, there's this paper by Affleck where he mentions something similar that if you have a, if you have a single field and then, and if you have a U1 and the U1 gets promoted to the cock modi and then the only possibility is C equals one. Guess the compactness of the field is important here. Yeah, That's yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, any other question?
right? If not, uh, let's thank 3D again. Thank you.